Could we keep going? The third speaker of today, Constantine, we are happy to have you. If you have any question, please raise your hand so Isabel can bring you the microphone and then give it back to her. Otherwise, people who is online cannot really listen to the to the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so the paper is joined with uh, three co-authors of mine, David, Fabrice, and Joe. Um, now, basically, we're moving on from like identified problems where there's some heterogeneity in people, how they post things with an N of 500 to an N of like 150,000. Okay, so uh, there's, but there's not going to be identified via an experiment or so forth. So there's no identification here. We're just going to try to kind of uh, assess heterogeneity. So the motivation, this paper is basically about the US mortgage market. Just as a preview, the US mortgage market runs on fixed rate mortgages. 30-year fixed rate mortgages that you are free to refinance. So what you can do is if your rate that you're paying is too high and the rate currently is lower than that, you can basically refinance at a relatively modest rate. Okay, so effectively there's a growing body of work that shows, however, that households are really bad at refinancing. Uh, they're like actually considerably suboptimal and there's a huge kind of difference in the cross-section. So some people are actually reasonably good, like my co-author Joe has refinanced five times in the last six years. So he's really good at refinancing. And there's other people who basically are really bad. Um, this paper is basically trying to measure this heterogeneity and kind of talk about the consequences of this heterogeneity. So effectively, there's cross-subsidies from the mortgage market, mainly because the US government subsidizes the mortgage market which leads to pooling for mortgages. So effectively, even though if the lender could figure out if you're like kind of smart, kind of, you know, like Joe, my co-author, or if you're like someone who never refinances, the mortgage market usually does not try to monetize that. Mainly because the US government subsidizes a part of the mortgage market and the US government pays for certain characteristics and they just don't pay for differentiated characteristics in a way that would make this profitable. Now, we're going to look at basically the cross subsidies and we're going to look at the impact of mortgage contract design and what we here call financial literacy programs, really programs that try to make people refinance more optimally. Okay? Bigger picture is really, if you think about wealth inequality, wealth inequality basically comes from idiosyncratic income, idiosyncratic return on assets, but also idiosyncratic rates paid on liabilities. And so really today is about number three, that there's basically for most American households, and I suspect for most households in the most of the world, the biggest liability you'll ever have is your mortgage. And it really matters what rate on, you pay on your mortgage. And if there's a huge difference on that, that can lead to kind of wealth inequality on its own. All right, today we're going to look at a low dimensional equilibrium in mortgage pricing model that basically allows for heterogeneity on the, uh, on the household side. We're going to evaluate the cross subsidies between the different households due to this pooling. And then we're going to do counterfactual calculations trying to think about increasing financial literacy or just removing frictions that keep people from refinancing, this overcoming suboptimality and the contract design. Left aside, we're not going to do any spec pool pricing. There's a bunch of data how people price these assets after they've been issued. Um, we, we're going to kind of do an approximation to the full stochastic PDE. That's just in the interest of just being as transparent as possible and having a tractable model. And we're not going to quantify the monetary policy password. Okay, so the preview is really we're going to have this tractable mortgage pricing model. And we're going to measure refi propensity, refinancing propensity, I'm going to abbreviate as refi, uh, in a large panel data set. And we're going to find their substantial heterogeneity. Uh, the, then we're going to calibrate the model where the pricing and then basically what we can show is that there's roughly 10% of the mortgage balance. Um, so if you have it for each dollar of mortgage that you have, there's effectively a cross subsidy of the fastest to the slowest borrowers of roughly 10% MPV over the lifetime. So this is a huge cross subsidy between basically whatever you want to call the slow people and the to the fast people. And we can cut the data in a few different ways. And then I'm uh, basically if you FICO is the credit score. High FICO people basically got a cross-subsidy from the low FICO people. Or P 
people with more than one mortgage seem to be kind of on average more attentive or more optimal in refinancing than people with only a single mortgage. And that basically accounts for roughly 2.5%. We're going to do some counterfactual analysis. Slowest households are heard if their attention improvement is effectively less than the average. And then we're going to talk about automatic refinancing mortgages that have been suggested by policymakers to remove this cross subsidy, but it's going to lead to uniform higher initial rates. Um, and then there's basically a trade off. All right. And let me skip the related literature. Dan Gottlieb actually has a paper on this, which is effectively life insurance has cross subsidies from early uh, behavioral labs as to households that see the contract through. So we're going to have a similar behavioral story, but our model is more dynamic in the sense like most of the pricing is going to come from a dynamic model. And so it's significantly different. So the economic setting, think about we don't have any pricing measure. We assume that the probabilities are just P and Q uh, coincide. So there's no, uh, there's no um, risk premium or anything here for today. And we're going to assume a CIR process for the interest rate. So that's basically... Uh, a Cox Ingelson Ross process that stays away from zero. Um, you can add more dimensions if we wanted to, but that's just really our kind of baseline. Now, mortgage market investors here, we have homogenous risk neutral investors. So they are the people who buy the mortgages after they've been originated. And they're going to be they're discounting at that short rate that kind of moves around. That's effectively our source of aggregate risk here, this uh, Brownian motion chart. And we're going to have capital is elastically supplied at that. So there's no kind of frictions in the sense that banks run up against some constraint or something like that. We're going to have investors offer mortgages at a rate M of T at a given state, and which is determined in equilibrium, and investors here are competitive. What that means is they're, they're going to make zero profit. You can put an I.O. model on top of this. It gets pretty messy. You think about a star 89 paper. Um, but we're going to do the uh, risk neutral, uh, we're going to do the um, zero profit version. All right, we're going to have households. Households here need to borrow for housing, take out a unit size $1 per touch door mortgage. So, this is really a simplification. Now, most mortgages, of course, have a maturity. We're going to assume that they move at an exogenous rate mu. And you can think of this as essentially including default risk and contractual maturity. So, effectively, all that we need is that everyone who has a mortgage... One second. Uh, yeah. Sorry. W what are P and Q in the previous slide? You said that... What are P and Q? I just missed, missed it. Oh, that's the physical probability uh, for asset pricing. That's physical probability and risk neutral probability. Uh, so we just assume everything is physical. I should have just left it out. No one would have asked any questions. So, uh, all right. So, effectively, we're going to have, you know, the only assumption is that when you have a mortgage, you keep, re you keep taking money out of the house. You keep remortgaging your house. So you never pay off your house fully. That's effectively the model. Of course, we can let people die, and then someone else has a mortgage for the house. So this is really an approximation. Now, the most important thing is they always have one mortgage outstanding. So this is not really a model of housing choice. You just have your house. You live in it. Um, and the most important thing, they pay attention to the financial market at Poisson times at an individual persistent rate chi. So that, that was our baseline assumption. I'm going to talk just in a second what we mean by chi. The mortgage contract is a fixed rate mortgage that has basically a coupon that was fixed at ever, whenever it was taken out. So if you entered your mortgage in, say, 2020, you have a mortgage rate of 3% in the U.S. If you take it out right now, it's more like 4.5%. 4 4 so it really... M star really just tracks the time at when you took out the mortgage. There's an option to prepay. We're going to assume it's costless. So to get rid of all the option pricing that if it costs you like $3,000 to refinance, you might want to wait until the gap is between the rate that you can get and the rate that you're paying is large enough. Now, I'm going to tell you what this is this kind of attention friction essentially makes this more tractable. We can talk about later how much we are off by basically uh, the refinancing. Households optimally refinance when there's a positive mortgage gap. That is when the rate that they're paying M star is higher than the rate that we can currently get in the market. And this is optimal as long as chi is persistent or chi changes 
maybe, but it's uncorrelated with their refinancing decision. All right, we're gonna have a, uh, we can think about two models. There's our AR paper in 2021, basically has no attention heterogeneity. There's a single type, you all pay attention with result chi, and you can derive this thing basically in closed form. There's a pricing function M, that is a function of the current interest rate R, and the attention parameter. Now with attention heterogeneity, what matters is the joint distribution at any given state. So in 2020, there is certain cross-sectional distribution of outstanding mortgage rates in the population. And of course, there's a joint distribution with respect to who the uh, kind of fast versus slow guys are. And so that distribution actually is a huge mess because it's a joint distribution that basically moves with the uh, aggregate state of the world. Now banks ex expect to face a certain cross-section. So if this is the current distribution that they're facing, of course the high chi guys pay more attention. So if the bank charges a certain rate M, they get a certain cross-section of attention rates that are trying to refinance. So in that sense, if mortgage rates are going down, most likely you're facing a pool as a bank that's gonna be more attentive than when rates are going up. They conjecture household refinancing behavior, and that affects the evolution then of FT, which in turn affects future pricing, and this is where the messiness starts, because now you have to forecast future cross-sectional distribution, because they establish future uh, prices, and future prices are the thing that determines if people are gonna refinance or not. Okay. Zero profit is basically a fixed point in a mean field game with aggregate shocks. Now, if we have basically a stable cross-sectional distribution of types in the population, that is, the people who pay attention are kind of a fixed proportion of the population, that makes this whole thing quite messy. And so, effectively, what we're gonna do, actually, let me just give you the interpretation of Kai, and then I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna kind of uh, try to approximate this with a, with a more tractable model. The interpretation of Kai is really, first of all, if old school, like, if you think about old school economic models, they usually would say, let's just put a fixed cost in there. It costs $2,000 to refinance. There's a question? Okay, so basically it costs $2,000 to refinance. This is a terrible assumption if you wanna actually match the data. The data is there's people who basically don't refinance even though they would have huge gains from refinancing. It's just a question, so in the zero profit condition that but these banks would like to would they like to impact this Poisson arrival rate? So is there money to be made if their policy like advertising campaigns are calling you up like hey, you know, you should do this and this? Exactly. So in this model there isn't. In reality there is because you're gonna get a small fee from refinancing. So in the last few years, kind of them kind of bombarding you with refinancing offers has gone up. Now the problem is that they bombard you with refinancing offers the same way I get spam calls. I used to live in Massachusetts and I get spam calls that say, you should refinance. I don't own a house and I don't live in Massachusetts. So most of the bombarding is kind of not very informational. If the bank that you originated the mortgage with calls you, maybe that is more informational. But the other way is just seems to be a lot of spam. Right. Yeah. Let me ask another question. Um, so if instead of being old school and take a fixed cost, we are super new school and we take a rational and attention approach. And then we think about um, the attention probability as related to the saliency of the event. And so I pay attention, the more distant is the current option on the market from the one I'm paying. For example, because my colleagues talk about it at lunch, oh, yeah. I just refinance my house because rates are great now. Yeah. But that- Yeah, that, that's essentially what the Kai is trying to catch. So, but the Kai is dependent on my M and the market M, or the Kai is no, just no, the, the, here the Kai is unconditional. You can think of more involved models where the Kai kind of represents aggregate conditions. Right. Maybe like after three years of falling rates, your Kai is gonna be higher than that. We're not gonna count for Yeah, that. I was just, okay. yeah, But okay. exactly. So the Kai is basically a catch-all for non-monetary frictions, effectively attention or awareness of market conditions. We're gonna assume that's unconditional. Now, it's not only that. There's effectively, there's people, we all know this, people who hate writing referee reports on time. Like, you know, we all procrastinate. 
But there's people, I have colleagues who all write their, all their referee reports on time. So there's definitely, given that we're all pretty educated and we can probably all figure out mortgages, there's still this other element, mental effort to fill out forms, procrastination, and so forth. And then finally, there's this thing which in the US is often talked about when you think about minorities. There's a dislike of interacting with mortgage bankers. Maybe they treat you like shit. Uh, because, you know, you come into the bank and they're like, uh, you know, like, I come in with a suit, they're nice to me, I come in with long hair and, like, look like disheveled, they're like, who are, who are you? All right, so we're going to do a simplifying assumption. And I'm going to give you two interpretations of the simplifying assumption. First, we're going to assume banks correctly assume that the agents are reset at prepayment to some constant distribution G. So effectively, we're going away here from persistent heterogeneity to saying whenever you refinance, you're redrawn from the chi distribution. And households follow the rule of thumb when they refinance. Now, I previously said it's optimal to refinance when you can get a lower rate. That's not the case under this assumption anymore because there's some optionality in keeping your high chi status if you think that the rate is going to drop further. The second assumption Second interpretation is bank incorrectly assumes that agents are reset and that they follow this rule of thumb, whereas in reality, households chi is persistent. Both of these things, assumptions basically cut through having to track this whole full cross-sectional distribution, which is going to be uh, kind of a B-field game with aggregate shocks, which we all know is virtually impossible to solve unless with, uh, with, uh, for small noise expansions. So we're going to do an approximation. The rule of thumb is mildly suboptimal, but it really only is the suboptimality is really strong and really high interest rates environments, which we don't really have a lot in the data. Okay, we're gonna have this tractable mortgage pricing model. Effectively, this is the thing that I want you to concentrate on. There's a profit from each mortgage that you, that you issue that is the discount or premium from the dollar, from its face value. So. If everyone were the same time, issued would be, mortgages would be issued at par. They would have a mortgage rate that exactly makes the value of the mortgage go to one. Now, what happens in reality is that there are some people you're going to make money on and some people you're going to lose money on. You're losing money on my co-author. You're making money on, say, Joe the plumber versus Joe the academic because Joe the plumber doesn't refinance. On average, you want to break even, and that's basically that condition. I'm going to calibrate the short rate process, and now let me talk about the data. Here we're going to have attention heterogeneity. We have CRISM monthly data set for, I guess, 230,000 individuals uh, from 2000. Um, we're going to assume a uniform moving propensity uh, of kind of 4% a year. And we're going to observe monthly refi decisions, cash out decisions, purchasing the mortgage. We're going, to assume, we're going to observe your credit score, your, loan to, your current loan-to-value ratio, your principal balance, your mortgage rate gap. That is, the mortgage rate you most likely would have to pay if you refinance today. We, we can see a bunch of characteristics, and so we know if you have a better credit score, you pay a slightly lower rate. So we're going to account for that, and we're going to basically fold all this mortgage rate into a mortgage rate gap. We're going to do a main data restriction. You might have concerns that households may exogenously be prevented from refinancing. What that means is that here we're going to have the month, a monthly observation is included if your loan to value ratio is below 80%, the FICO is above 675, and the balance is above 50,000. These two are basically would you be able to refinance? The balance being large enough is would it be worthwhile for you to refinance? And we're going to exclude 2008 to 2010. We don't observe employment status. And it might, you might, even if you fulfill all these requirements, if you just lost your job and the bank knows this, they might not refinance you. Okay, so the ratio of interest for us is for each household, for each I, we're going to observe how many periods would have been beneficial to refinance. Let's call them the effective periods. Um, in effectively, periods in which the gap would have been larger than some X, here we take half a percent. In the model, strictly speaking, it would be 0%. We know in reality you probably need a bit more to get moving. And we're going to assume how many times did you actually refi in those months. And so just to show you the, basically, we're going to have, this is the data. There's a few people here who actually, they had two periods where it was effective. They refinanced in two periods. They get a one. And what you can see is there's a bunch of people who never refinance. 
So even though they had a bunch of periods in which they would have been able optimal to refinance, they didn't. Just to show you this, an estimated CDF form. So this starts at 75%. Uh, so effectively, roughly three quarters of the sample never refinances, even though it would have been optimal to do so. And as you can see here, depending on the gap, you can have a lower CDS is, of course, higher propensity refinance. And so effectively, we're going to have uh, a slight difference here. All right. So the next thing we're going to look at is, well, these are observations by household. We want to think about the banks. People don't have a unit size mortgage. So effectively, we want to weigh basically the people by the unit, by the mortgage they take out. Because for a bank, they issue dollars. They don't issue to a unit size mortgage to everyone. And so when you weigh that, you can see people pay more attention. That's basically because the cause of, there's a correlation between higher mortgage balances and higher attention. All right. Then I'm going to show you one of these splits, and then we can basically uh, talk a bit about what the model implies. What's the split going to show you is the difference in the CDF if I were to split the sample into above median credit score to below median credit score. And so what you see here is that if you have a higher credit score, you on average pay attention or it's the first order stochastic dominance argument, basically. So people with a high FICO pay more attention than people with low FICO in a first order stochastic dominance sense. That's not for the zero gap, but for the red and the green gap, they do. Similar results hold for splitting the uh, sample by loan amount, splitting the sample by if you have a multiple mortgages outstanding at any given point or just a single mortgage. So it might be you have two mortgages, you have your own home, and you have a rental property somewhere. But it does not work for a lo loan to value ratio. Okay, so just to keep that in mind. We're going to transform this into intensities. So this now ranges from zero to five. And again, this is all data estimated CDF. The next thing we're going to do is we want to reduce heterogeneity down. Our model basically requires us to solve on a, on a matrix, so we can't just put in a cumulative distribution function. So what we do is we do a maximum likelihood. I can show you here, if you have n equals 1, you estimate basically everyone pays attention at 0 0.013 or something like that. But now, as you introduce more and more data points, the, you basically approximate the uh, CDF. Now, one of the important things is maximum likelihood estimation treats a 0 out of 2 differently than a 0 out of 20. Because a 0 out of 20, it's very expensive to not adjust the probability of 0. Where 0 out of 2, a probability of, say, 0.1 is not as expensive to put in. Okay, so just to... Afterwards, if maybe during question time, there is... It's, it's not clear what the optimal grouping is. This is basically machine learning. How do you optimally reduce the size of heterogeneity to something tractable? And there's a few methods we can use. I'm going to stick with five, n equals to five. It gives me an estimate that there's basically 80% who never pay attention, 6% who pay attention once every basically four years, if you one over two. And then basically there's 1% of people who pay attention like once every two months. Okay, so just to just do the, the inverse of chi basically gives you the, uh, the expected time between refinancing, uh, between attention events. Yeah. Does the date at which people got their initial uh, loan matter? Because, you know, some people might have gotten a loan in a world in which interest rates were very low. low. Yeah. And they stayed kind of low for a long time, so right, refinancing was not part of the lingo of their, you know. Oh, you mean like like they never had to refinance, so they never really thought about it, so they never learned how to refinance? Right, it wasn't the thing. Well, instead, if you refinance already once, because you, you see what I'm saying? Like, if, if, you, if you live in a period, if, if during your tenure you had incredible swings, yeah. you want to do it, and then once you've done it a couple of times, you might just as well do it four. That's right, that's right. So here it's very... So some time fix effect will pick that up. Here it's really hard because our heterogeneity is basically a lot of zeros. So we can't really cut the data. In that way, I see. Yeah. Um, I mean, we should think harder about that, but 
at the moment, I don't really have a good answer. What, what I was thinking is that you may want to, for example, plot. The, you have types, right? So you can look at these types in this n equal to five, and then you can see how their their date, original date of of thing. And yeah, yeah, I, I could do that. Yep. I can actually the uh, the identifiers are running numbers, so I could just give you the average of their running number, right. and if they have a higher running number, that it's going to tell us something about. That means they are later. Yeah. So now with these five data points I just showed you from the maximum likelihood estimation, we're going to plug them into the model with the interest rate process to basically think about pricing. So the first part was basically thinking about data heterogeneity. Now, hopefully I convinced you that there's some heterogeneity in the data, not everyone acts the same. Now, what that means is that, what is on this graph? We're gonna have the horizontal axis, we have the interest rate. These, uh, the pink curve in the background is basically the steady state distribution of the CIR process. So you're gonna spend most of your time around 3%. And you're going to spend some time at 7.5%, but you know, out here, it's basically, you're unlikely to go to 10% interest rates. The dash black line is going to be our mortgage pricing in the heterogeneous world. If you had homogeneous agents, that is, everyone just had the average attention rate in the population, which is 0 0.184, you would get the gold line. Now, why is there a difference? The difference is that the fast guys don't stay in the mortgage for very long, whereas the slow guys stay in the mortgage actually a lot longer than the, uh, than the average. So effectively, there is a difference in duration that, is that basically changes the pricing. If we were to give people the mortgage they deserve, in the sense that the mortgage that their type, if you could differentiate on type, and could discriminate on type, you would get all these different colorful lines. And you see that the blue line is relatively to the dash line. The blue line is the completely inattentive people, and again, that's 80% by our estimation. But then, like, the Joes of the world would have to pay a significantly higher interest rate. So we can think about this in terms of the subsidy, we can take the difference, and basically you see there's substantial subsidies in terms of the rate space. Okay? And so, basically, Investors break even on the current mortgage, but that doesn't mean that the households are staying in there at the same time, the same duration. And the equilibrium consequence is basically several households provide large cross subsidies to almost all other groups in terms of type dependent investor MPV per mortgage. Yeah. Or oh, because of the, the setup. So, Umberto asks, why don't, they, why don't the banks try to differentiate them? First, attention is really hard to differentiate on because as we all know, we, we might all be procrastinating even if we have like certain characteristics. The second thing, the US, pool, the US pooling equilibrium via the Fannie Freddie housing market does not pay for that. So even if I manage to originate a certain mortgage, I don't really get that much additional. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, so effectively now, this is the cross subsidies in the rate space. So here at the average interest rate, basically you have 1%, Joe, my co-author, should pay 1%, 100 basis points more than he's paying, basically for most, uh, for most of the uh, mortgages. And in, effectively in the MPV space, if you take the average of this over the distribution G, you basically get the zero profit condition. And you see that the slow people are the only people who basically lose money and or banks make money off the slow people and they lose money on pretty much everyone else. Okay, so now the next thing is let's think about inequality. How many minutes do I have? Like 10 or 15? Okay, so let's think about kind of mortgages as a driver of inequality. So effectively, single's largest, li largest liability for a household over their life. Uh, differences in rate can be quite substantial then in terms of how much they affect your wealth. And even when there's no price discrimination at origination. So we are really excluding already that maybe there's some discrimination when you take out the mortgage. People just, you walk in, they're like, this guy is not a, you know, very good at getting good mortgage pricing. Let's give him a terrible rate. We're going to exclude that. So everything here, all the differences come from dynamic beha suboptimal behavior. And so slower groups pay larger average coupons over time. So here, 
Suppose we started with our estimated pool. Suppose we started in 2005. And we just followed these people through 2021. So that's a falling interest rate environment for most of it. And this is basically the average coupon they pay. And you can see that the really fast types have a substantially lower average coupon than the slow types. And so that was basically what our model implies. Here's a paper that basically does this with a bunch of microdata. So there's a paper by Girardi, Will, and Jang. And the US housing market basically has an anti-discrimination law that requires everyone to register when they make an offer, the race and other characteristics of borrowers. It's called Hamda. And basically, they use this. And one of the factors they use, they basically use race. And what they say is that black and Hispanic white borrowers face challenges refinancing because, on average, they have lower credit scores, equity, and income. But even after you control for this, you can see that basically there's still a difference in prepayment behavior. So just to show you the graph from their paper, on the left, this is basically you start in 2005, and you basically just follow by here a racial category. It's just one characteristic that's observable. Of course, we would like to have other characteristics in the, Hamda, in the data set, but that's just one that the law requires to be disclosed. So that's an easy one to follow. And what they can show is that even if they remove all discrimination at origination, so they give everyone when they refinance the average rate, you can see that there's basically black borrowers pay 50 basis points more than what comparable white borrowers as, in the, as you go through from 2005 to 2014. So now the question in our data is, we have a bunch of data. We don't have racial characteristics or anything. We have FICO, we have LTV. Now, what you might want to wonder is, how much heterogeneity do you need between groups to generate 50 basis points? So let's first take maybe FICO, like above median FICO, below median FICO. When I plug that into the model, I can at most generate 18 basis points difference. So the heterogeneity that seems to be inherent in the kind of, if you think about the left side, seems to be larger than the FICO heterogeneity. The only heterogeneity that kind of measures it is if you have multiple mortgages or not. So multiple mortgage owners pay so much more attention that, or pay attention at a differential rate high enough to basically get you to the 50 basis points on the left. So that's just say, telling you something. We're not trying to match the left. I'm just trying to say how much heterogeneity does a model need to include to give you differential effects like what you observe in the data. All right, so now, how big are these cross-subsidies we kind of talked about? So then the next question is, how big are the cross-subsidies? And effectively, we're going to look at lifetime MPV per loan, assuming counterfactually that you're a persistent type. So everyone around you switches, but you are a persistent type. And of course, we can kind of, that's one. And we can also look at the organic average coupon that you're going to pay. The first one here, this is basically if you're a persistent type in the pricing that assumes kind of resetting, Joe basically over his lifetime gets a third, you know, uh, let's, just, let's just pick here the average rate here, gets a 15% basically subsidy on his MPV. So for each dollar he pays, he has to pay basically the equivalent of 85 cents. Whereas if you're a slow borrower, you basically pay the equivalent of 103 or 105 cents for your mortgage over your lifetime, rolling over. So that means that effectively there's huge cross-subsidies in the model that extend past the current mortgage. So the whole thing is quick people leave the current mortgage quickly, and so we need to account for all the dynamic effects. On the left, you're going to have effectively what each of these groups pays as an average coupon. Of course, the slow people pay a higher average coupon. They pay a higher average coupon than even the homogenous setting. And then, of course, the fastest people pay a low average coupon. The next one is, let's think about not differences. So the differences here are by type. But we can't really identify type that easily. So we don't have any characteristics on type. We know there are some slow people out there, but we don't really know who they are. What we know is, however, that the distribution, say, cutting by FICO or cutting by multiple mortgages, that has, is, is based on an observable. And so when we plug that in, if you have a high versus a low FICO, you have a lifetime MPV difference of roughly 
if you have a high verse, uh, if you have multiple versus single mortgage holder, at the kind of mean, you have a lifetime difference of roughly two and a half, three percent. And so these are substantial cross subsidies that are flowing through the mortgage market. Now the next thing is people are people are kind of policymakers want to address that. And how do they address it? They want to basically have policies that reduce the barriers to refinancing. Here is essentially improving the CHI distribution. Now think about this as maybe financial literacy or maybe kind of other frictions. Maybe, you know, getting banks to not treat you as badly when you come in or basically getting people off the procrastination train, which might be harder. But suppose you can change the distribution, then effectively, how do we discipline that? We're going to discipline that by basically saying, we're going to, uh, we're going to shift you from, say, observed below median to above median distribution. So effectively, we want to have some discipline on the model. Here, these are, this is the value of the current mortgage to the household. So if you're, if you're Joe, you're gold. A mortgage at the moment for each dollar you make, you know, 1.8 cents. That's the net value of this mortgage because of the refinancing option. If you're the slow guy, you lose money. What are the dash lines? The dash lines is basically what changes to the pricing when we shift everyone to the more attentive cross-sectional distribution. What happens? Everything moves down. The pricing moves against you. That's the basically equilibrium effect here. As people get more attentive, you're going to get worse rates. What that means is if you are one of the inattentive people that after whatever intervention is still inattentive, you're worse off. So in effect, if you think as a policymaker you want to get people you know, to refinance more, effectively you might, you're going to make some people worse off if, they, if, they're kind of below, if, they're, if their improvement is below the median attention improvement in the, in the economy, basically. And that's also borne out by the lifetime MPV. This is this is persistence over the life. This is on the single mortgage that you take out at the moment. Now, the next one, basically, we can do here. This one was basically shifting from below FICO median to above FICO median. That's a relatively mild improvement. The bigger improvement would be moving from single mortgage to multi-mortgages. And then you can see the attention improvement really moves the pricing against the inattentive. So if you're still inattentive, after that improvement, you're really screwed. Now, finally, let's think about an automatic refinancing mortgage. If you know Harris Holmstrom paper on labor market uh, wage setting, that is basically the, uh, the equivalent in, in the opposite direction. So effectively, your mortgage, without you having to do anything, is going to adjust to the lowest rate over the life of its, over its life. What you get here is, let's go back to the original graph I showed you. The dashed black line was the mortgage pricing that you get in the heterogeneous case. If you have a homogeneous case with the same average attention rate, you get the gold line. And basically, what's the teal line here? That's chi equal to infinity. That's the automatic refinancing mortgage. And what you see is you get much more steepness. And you're going to get that it never crosses the 45 degree line. That's because it has a downside option. But what that means is effectively, well, first of all, there's more monetary policy pass through. If you move R around, you're going to get a lot more differences in M. But what that also means is that higher, you're going to have higher initial rates. So for every, for every initial rate R, the mortgage rate that you have to pay at the initiation of the mortgage is going to be higher. So it's unclear that this is actually a benefit to everyone. Now, let me just walk through this. Average mortgage rates over the life of the mortgage are lower. Because over the life of the mortgage is going to go down as the interest rates move around. But the initial rate is going to be higher. And so if CHI is negatively correlated with the likelihood of financial constraints, suppose you buy houses because you can barely afford the monthly payment then effectively you can't buy the house anymore you want. Because you are basically constrained because the initial, even though you can, my example would be you can drown in a pool that's on average 10, 10 inches deep. That's the same here. On average you pay a lower rate, that doesn't mean that you can afford the initial rate. And so that's basically one. And so effectively you might ask yourself, is there going to be unraveling? We're going to introduce, introduce this new mortgage product that is automatic refinancing. 
other traditional 30-year fixed rate mortgages, are, are they going to become extinct? In a fully rational model without any other financial constraints? Yes, because the lowest CHIs know I'm paying across subsidy. Let me get into the automatic refinancing mortgage that by, by design does not have any cross subsidies. As they move out, the pricing in the traditional market adjusts and the lowest guys left are the ones screwed, they leave and so forth. What's the obstacle to unraveling? Well, the first is what I just said, the financial constraints. I just can't afford the initial rate. And so I go, even though I know I'm paying a cross subsidy, I'm pay, basically paying for liquidity. I'm basically willing to pay a bit more to have a lower rate today, even though on average I'm going to lose. But the second point kind of goes back to the maybe behavioral interpretation here. Some households may have a hard time understanding the dynamic properties. Now, I can all tell you it refinances according you know, to the minimum of the rate. Then you're going to have to have a view of the minimum of the rate. And for some households, that might be really difficult uh, kind of mental, mental calculation to make. And so it's unclear that even introducing this mortgage that would probably help the worst types, kind of the slowest types, it's unclear that the market would completely shift to that. And who, who is going to shift is also unclear. So let me just wrap up. So we have a tractable mortgage pricing model where we measure refi propensity in a large panel data set as the input to the pricing. We're going to find large heterogeneity in the data. Calibrated models suggest that there's significant cross subsidies, roughly 10% of mortgage balance over the life of the over the life of the um, over the life of the sink uh, of the agent uh, for the fastest versus slowest household. We can't tie that to any characteristics. Trying to tie it to characteristics, we're going to get roughly 75 basis points for below above median credit score, and two and a half ba uh, two and a half percent, 250 basis points for basically the attention difference between multi multiple mortgage holders versus single mortgage holders. And then we analyzed, I, financial literacy might be the wrong word, maybe just trying to shift the distribution up. It's either financial literacy if you think this is attention. It might be other things like reducing frictions that are non-monetary for, uh, for another interpretation of CHI. And then basically the main thing here is that even though this is better on average, most inattentive households, if they stay inattentive, are still screwed. So that's, I think, the, the takeaway here. All right. Any questions? There's a, there's a few questions here. When we start in the back and then. So I have a, it might be related to Umberto's question. Uh, yeah. So it's about the role of public uh, information and proxies uh, for attention. So you had a zero profit condition that's inducing all the cross subsidies. Yeah. But if you had public information about, uh, say, say there are two groups, high FICO and low FICO, and yeah. I don't understand this market enough, but maybe you could condition uh, the contract on that. So we should see zero profits for each of the oh, yeah. two groups and we shouldn't see a lot of cross subsidies yeah. flowing across groups or actually any in, in, in the specification of the model, right. right? So you're asking why is there pooling? So there is pooling because the US government decides to cross subsidize, to subsidize this market and the US government pays prices that are not market prices. So the US government has a matrix that says you're going to, if you're the mortgage originator, we're going to pay you a certain amount if you originate a mortgage with a FICO of like 750 and a loan to value ratio of 80%. So maybe, so and there's mispricing in that, in that matrix. So clearly there is some mortgages which you want to sell to the government and some mortgages which you don't want to sell because there's mispricing. Some, some things are juicy to sell to the government, some are not. What we observe in reality is that most mortgage originators actually don't hold any mortgages on their books. Effectively, the liquidity that the government provides by buying these mortgages off their hands and providing the default subsidy seems to swamp any kind of uh, market segmentation that you imagine. Now, in other countries, that might not be the case. So in the UK, maybe in Brazil, I don't think there's a, there's a you, kind of federal subsidy for that market that into induces this mispricing that then gives you um, that then gives you kind of your argument why why don't these guys cut the market up uh, 
let me make a political economy twist. Suppose that I follow your last slide, not what you did not recommend to do, which is suppose we do automatic change, you know, automatic adjustment. Um, here's another concern. Political economic implication, enormous uh, political pressure to lower interest rates, yeah. right? Because now everybody will get their mortgage go down. Yeah. So that will be completely unsustainable. Well, there's still, there's still the, the price is still set by private investors. So it's unclear. Fair that enough, but, but the central bank has quite a. Exactly. Right? So, so the, well. So what I mean is that then you really need super strong independence of the central yeah, bank. Yeah. You know, yeah, kind exactly. of like your ECB as opposed to Fed. Exactly. So monetary policy is also going to be more path dependent. So effectively, right. after like 2020, if we had automatic refinancing, you're done. That's it. This generation is, is good forever. Min. No one would like whatever the Fed does has no impact on the refinancing channel right. because everyone is already at their mint. Yeah. So you're completely right that in environments in which we basically came out of a long, high-rate environment, there's a lot of political pressure there. I, I completely agree. Um, any other questions? Why? OK, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Konstantin. Thank you.